Hello everybody, Colleen Patrick Goudreau here with Aaron Zellhofer and Kevin Jonas. Hi. From Beagle Freedom Project. How do you identify yourself as a marathon Boston qualified runner? Is that how you do it? Yeah, I just qualified, so let's use that. I'm just a, a vegan athlete. Vegan athlete right yeah. here. Um, hi everybody, I'm so happy to see my friends Aaron and Kevin. I haven't seen you in forever. Too long. Way too long. I saw you... You were in Minnesota like five or six years ago? Five or six yeah. years ago, and you I saw, I don't even know, a dog's age ago. I saw you at the Animal Rights Conference in June, so it wasn't that long ago. Actually, it wasn't dog's age. That feels like a dog's age <laughs> to me, who's older than you are, so it felt like a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, so yeah, I haven't seen these guys in forever, and they're here staying with us overnight, and in a couple minutes, we have to go to, Millen we have to, go to yeah. Millennium. It's a chore. It's a chore. <laughs> it's really hard. Yes. So um, we're meeting David there at Millennium, and I thought we would take this opportunity to talk about the Beagle Freedom Project, which uh, Kevin and Aaron are both involved in, mm -hmm. and ask you guys a little bit about it. So hi, everybody. Welcome, Aaron Hello. and Kevin. Hi. Thanks for watching. Yay. Um, so, Kevin, mm. tell us about the Beagle Freedom Project. Beagle Freedom Project is a unique little organization. It's a nonprofit based in Los Angeles, and it's a national rescue and advocacy organization for research animals. What we do is we negotiate for the release of animals from laboratories after the research is done. We hate animal testing. We have a policy position for scientific reasons as well as, as, well as uh, ethical reasons, but we do our best to reach out to the research community to try to encourage them while they're using these animals, even if we disagree with it, to at least give them a second chance at life when the testing is done. And so over the last five years that our organization has been around, we've rescued about a thousand animals from laboratories in 36 states and eight countries. We're called Beagle Freedom Project because um, sadly the common breed of dog they use in laboratories are beagles. About 65,000 dogs a year and about 95% of them are beagles. Uh, they're the breed of choice precisely for the same great reasons that we love them as family companions. They're gentle, they're docile, they're people-pleasing, they don't bite, um, and they're easy to care for. And so beagles are commonly used to test toxicity of things where they will have something put over their snout and they're forced to inhale things, or they take a big tube, it's called oral gavage, and they'll shove it down their trachea, and they'll pour a chemical or caustic or toxic substance into them at certain concentrations to see what happens. So while we're fighting against animal testing, we feel at Beagle Freedom Project, one of the best ways to connect with people, anybody, no matter what your position on animal testing is, whether you think it's a tragic necessity or morally reprehensible, there's a common sense middle ground, and that's when the research is done, the experiment is over, Please let these dogs, these cats, these guinea pigs, these rats, these mice, these pigs, these goats, these horses, all of which we've rescued, go to a home. Um, and it's been phenomenally successful. It's a great way of engaging the public about a very serious issue, but in a way they can understand, identify, and empathize with. Mm -hmm. Because 60 million Americans share their homes with cats like, you know, Charlie, or dogs like my Raymond or Junior, and they understand my cat is really special to me. My dog is really special to me. So those dogs in that laboratory, they're not these abstract, furry little mm -hmm. test tubes. They're dogs no different than the ones we love and share our homes with. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, the book I'm working on right now is on language, the language we use around, around animals, mm -hmm. to talk about animals. And one of the things we do is when we categorize animals as laboratory animals, or as you say, laboratory animals. Um, <laughs> it's my history in anti-vivisection in England. I picked up a little you nuances. You did, you did. Um, it, it changes the way we think about them. We categorize the animals in our homes as worthy of our mm -hmm. love and respect and dignity. And then we call them laboratory animals. Yeah. And we just think about them differently, which is really just about semantics and has nothing to do with the animals themselves because the animals who are in these laboratories are just as sensitive to pain and suffering as the animals in our home. It's the way we can disassociate it. And it's common parlance in the research industry, too. They don't call these dogs dogs. They're subjects. Right. They don't have names. Inside of their ears are tattooed federal ID numbers that identify them. They're not allowed identities or individuality because that would make it hard for the people that work there to subject them to things that are beyond our worst nightmares. And when they 
kill them, they're not actually killing them. They're sacrificing them. Yeah. It's language does make a big difference yeah. in how we psychologically cope with some of the violence we encounter in our daily lives and we may even participate in. For sure. We have yeah. a lot to talk about. We do. That's a whole chapter. I have a whole chapter um, on, on the language the industries use um, to soften what they know the public is really uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's their awareness of the public sensitivity that compels them to use language that basically masks the violence that they're committing against animals. That's why at Beagle Freedom Project, we have this logo, it's names, not numbers. And any time a dog, a cat, any animal comes out of a laboratory, giving them a name is, is important, yeah. not just for the animal, but for us to recognize that they are unique, special, and unlike any other dog, any other goat, any other mouse, they are special and unique in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. And giving them that name and stripping them of that laboratory identity where it was just a tattooed number. Yeah. How old are the dogs typically? Um, it can be anywhere. We've rescued puppies um, that were used in research in utero when they were unborn and exposed to toxic chemicals inside. And we've rescued dogs from laboratories as old as 12 years old. 12 years in a laboratory cage, never having been outside, never having a bed, a treat, a leashed walk, you know, affection yeah. from people. And so when they come out, um, it's a pretty bewildering, emotionally powerful experience, not just for the dog, but for all of us that get the privilege of watching it. And we do videos all over BFP.org, BeagleFreedomProject.org, um, about these first encounters with just grass right. and the sunshine and figuring out how big and huge this world is. And it's profound. Right on. Yeah, I had some friends who had, it was before Beagle Freedom Project was doing any of this work. She had had a friend who had a contact and she had a beagle from a lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't know how to, he didn't know what grass was. He didn't know mm -hmm. how to poop on the grass. He didn't know how to deal with anything that was just in our normal atmosphere. He only knew what had to be in a cage. They're adult dogs, and but they have like a puppy mentality. Mm -hmm. They're not house trained. They're not leash trained. They know zero words. They don't have a name. And so even if you get like a six-year-old dog, and I think the majority of the dogs we get are about between four and six and that's a long time to spend in labs um, and they come out and they're puppies they want to play they want to rip things up they want to pee everywhere because they're used to when you're in a cage and you have slated floors you just pee and go to the bathroom whenever yeah. you have to you'd never have the concept of do I hold it until <laughs> I go outside so potty training can often be really difficult but it's not impossible Aaron and I have two beagles from laboratories they were potty trained they're happy healthy little dogs Aww. Pumpkins. Yeah. Do we have any questions here? Let me see if there's anybody. My daughter Megan is getting her PhD in neuroscience at UConn and is fighting against animal testing. Fabulous. <laughs> hey, Connecticut, we passed our signature legislation there, the Beagle Freedom Bill. So if UConn is using any dogs in laboratories, by law in Connecticut, when that experiment is done, they have to turn them over to a public rescue charity like Beagle Freedom Project so we can find them appropriate homes. That's great. Actually, is it UCOM? It says C O M M. Oh, UCOM. But I want what's maybe UCOM is common. Maybe for it was a typo. Maybe yeah. it was an autocorrect. Because I don't know what UCOM. I don't either. No. I don't either. Um, okay, but we'll come back to it. Bonnie, let us know if um, what the uh, university is. But that's fantastic. And actually, um, talk more about the legislation then, because that's important. So certainly. So there's 65,000 dogs used annually in U.S. laboratories, as I said. And Beagle Freedom Project has saved about 1,000 in five years. So obviously, that's a drop in the bucket. Every year, we reach out to every laboratory in North America, 383 of them that use dogs and cats. And we reach out to them by a letter, email, and telephone call twice saying, here's our program. We will come and pick up the animals. We'll pay for transportation. We'll pay for veterinary care. We'll sign non-disclosure agreements, liability agreements. We'll even send you pictures of these dogs on their couches once they're safely in their home for your own morale. Just don't kill them. Let them go. And sadly, most of these laboratories don't voluntarily do so. So we came up with a public policy solution that says, if you take our taxpayer dollars, i.e. your research university like UConn or UC Davis or UCLA or University of Missouri, wherever you are, then by law, if you're using our dollars to pay for that dog, when the experiment is done, we want that dog back. And so five yeah. states have passed this legislation, California, Nevada, Minnesota, New York, and Connecticut. And we're working in Illinois and Maryland right now, too, before we take it federal. Is there anything people can do specifically to help? 
you got to sign up to be on our email list because we do things in every state. We always have events. We're always doing releases. We always have educational opportunities, legislation we're working on. So go to bfp.org. If you want to adopt or foster, you can fill out an application there. We have a free smartphone app. There's something you can, everybody can do every single day of their life when you go to the store to buy new shampoo, detergent, toothpaste, household cleaning products, makeup, always either look for the product label that says not tested on animals cool. or download cruelty cutter and you can go into any store and scan the barcode and it instantly tells you on the spot if that product is tested on Shut animals up. or not so you don't have to go through some big what? list looking and then you can socially share either your protest or your that. purchase and we collect the data on the back end so when i go to the annual general meeting for uh, procter and gamble i can say from our app alone, you've lost this much market share and this much dividend per shareholder. So animal testing doesn't pay. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah. God, I've been like in a box or something. I don't know where <laughs> I've been. BFP.org, yes, and it was a typo, so it was Yukon. So that's exciting, Bonnie. Very so that it is Connecticut it is Connecticut. Um, I Trisha says I have a coworker who adopted a beagle Ooh, from you. Yay. And lots of support. Um, Donna has a support group for people who have adopted dogs that come from puppy mills and hoarding in labs. It's a very similar that, situation. That's great. So Donna has a link right there because it's it absolutely is necessary because it is it it's is like special similar. needs. They're special needs babies. They're special needs. There's a lot of crossover between puppy mill dogs, especially the breeder dogs, those poor dogs, um, and laboratory dogs because okay. they just live in cages their whole lives. I don't know how to be dogs. Yeah. It's so, so sad. Amazing work. Um, I'm not deleting your comment, Bonnie. I almost did, though. Um, Amanda says, thank you for doing this important work and for bringing awareness. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Amanda's a good friend of mine, but I didn't pay her to, <laughs> to say that. I didn't. <laughs> I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, um, Don says, to be a society that supposedly has progressed, we are still living in the ice age with animal testing. It's very sad. I am a consummate optimist. I am too. I do believe this will end. Now, my lifetime is going to end sooner than your lifetime. Debatable. <laughs> Depends on what we eat, eat and drink tonight. Yes. Um, but I really do believe animal testing is going to end in our lifetime. I do believe that. I know it for a fact. The trends in the scientific community right now are all pointing towards non-animal models for scientific reasons. You know, 92% of the drugs that pass as safe in animal studies fail in phase one human clinical trials. It's a 92% failure rate. And of that 8% that makes it to the market, puts one in seven people in a hospital bed with an adverse reaction to prescription drug. This isn't a good model. And we're not opposed to research because we don't want there to be cures for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or cancer. We do, all of us, every one of us have lost somebody to this. This is not good research. Um, and so Beagle Freedom Project isn't just attacking the problem, we're also part of the solution. We're offering up a quarter of a million dollars in grants every year to scientists and research teams pioneering effective replacements for animal models. Oh, and we're going to be working to get the FDA to lift the mandatory requirement to test all new drugs on animals. Just like it is for cosmetics. You don't have to test cosmetics on to animals. Some companies choose to do so for whatever perverse reason. Many do not, and it should be the same way with drugs and other research. I love it. I love the work you're doing. I love that you're coming at it from so many different angles. It's so yeah. important. It's so important. I love it. Okay, hold on. Let me see if there's anything else. Because we got a reservation of Millennium, people. Um, <laughs> what's more important? Come yeah. on. <laughs> um, I would love to adopt from BFP. Do you adopt to Alaskans? Not Alaskans, but do you adopt to Alaska? In Alaska. Well... Alaskans. Like, you don't discriminate against Alaskans. <laughs> no, no. We love people from Alaska. We have many supporters in Alaska. We have a lot of downloads for there's a cruelty cutter in Alaska. However, Alaska doesn't have a lot of research laboratories. And one thing we don't like to do unless it's necessary is if we adopt, if we rescued a dog from a laboratory, say, in California or Colorado or Washington State, we try to find them homes within a short driving distance because we don't want animals having to trans or travel too far or go in the belly of a plane or something like that. So typically a lot of the rescues happen within about 50 miles of the laboratory we pull the animals okay. from. So would you do, are there exceptions made? Is there someone that she could there, connect there with? There are with exceptions that? made and the exceptions are if you have a profoundly unique and um, 
situation with your home that would fit an animal that needs a situation or a home like that because maybe some dogs we know can't be um they hate loud noises so we're not going to put them by an airport mm -hmm. some dogs don't like to be with other dogs or cats so they have to be in a home with no other animals um, so there could be the various factors and we have adopted animals certainly to people that don't live within 50 miles of the lab We've just not yet hit Alaska. So maybe you okay. are our home in Alaska. <gasps> we want somebody in every state truly Okay, because these are our ambassadors for sure for sure But there's other things they can do in Alaska too, right? I mean there's other ways to get 100% okay. just go to bfp.org and one thing we have this other campaign called identity campaign so maybe you don't live near a laboratory, or maybe you just are not in a place in life where you can take in a dog from a laboratory and give them all that training, but you still want to help animals in labs. We have a program called the Identity Campaign where you virtually adopt a unique individual animal in a laboratory, just you, and when you adopt this animal, we work with you to submit records requests. You can learn everything there is to know about this dog, the experiment they're enduring, is it terminal, and how can you, with us, advocate for their freedom? love that. I love that it's brilliant. Yeah, we don't want to wait just for like when the laboratory mm -hmm. tells us these are the animals we're going to let you have. We're identifying the ones we think we should be able to rescue mm. by law now in five states. That's amazing. Yeah. You guys are amazing. Thank amazing. You. I'm really impressed. Um, hold on. Let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, we got to go. Oh my God, we got to go. But we can do another one tomorrow and um, I've got to feed my cats or I'm going to be you know, accused of neglect, of kitty neglect. I'm watching. So, um, so bfp.org and Aaron, thank um, you so much. Check out Strong Hearts uh, Vegan Power if you're interested into running and veganism. That's uh, a great runner vegan group. Strong Hearts. Vegan, strong Hearts Vegan Power .org. Sorry, Strong Hearts Vegan Power .org. And someone can type that below so that when people come back and watch this video, it's in the comments below. Let's do another one tomorrow. Let's That's do it. Fun. Okay. Yeah, Thanks, too. everybody. Bye. See you later. Oh, my husband just texted and said, where are you? Um, we're coming. Okay, bye, everybody.